Hey everyone, welcome back to the Cosmic Bridge with me, Mikey Hansen. And today is a first on the show because we have Michael Chapman, who is the first person who's come on the show twice. So he was on episode two and now he's joining us over a year later. I really enjoyed the conversation, which is why I wanted to invite him back. Uh, he is the CEO of Lead in Media, which is a LinkedIn lead generation agency. He also talks today about how he started doing some coaching, one-on-one -on -one personal development coaching. But his story, for those of you who didn't listen to the last show, in 2017, had a tough period of his life where he'd gone through two divorces, loss of a child, multiple job losses, and then eventually had this kind of like dark night of the soul that led to him really strengthening his faith and eventually starting his own business, like transforming his relationship. Uh, with God. And as he said, the rest is history. But today he's going to be talking about some controversial topics related to the scandal that's happened recently at Harvard, related to pronouns, related to the topic of entitlement and like culture, because he's got staff in Serbia and staff uh, in the US and talking about like the differences uh, between the two. So yeah, let's get into it. Let's listen to what Michael has to say. So Michael, you actually, I think it's technically episode two on the Cosmic Bridge, but it was really episode one because the first one was just me kind of introducing the show. Yeah. So you were the very first guest we've had. We're, we're here over a year later. If anyone wants to go back and listen to episode two, we talked about scarcity versus abundance mindset. Great, yeah. great show to listen to. Uh, but yeah, today I know you wanted to, and I, I was interested to speak about it as well because I've seen it as a topic in your post, but talk about entitlement so what, what are your views on entitlement going into 2024 we're recording this in january 2024 well i'll fall on the first sword <laughs> you know i have to do that um i always say it's okay to be to have hypocrisy and irony as long as you call it out first it's not okay <laughs> but like call your first out right because it's easier to look at it's easy to look at you and call yours out it's much more difficult to look in the mirror yes. you know for me and entitlement's a is a disease. And, um, I grew up with it, which we'll talk about, you know, I think I had, you know, growing up in the United States as an eighties kid, you know, it's easy to be entitled, you know, when, you know, things around you are sort of good and sometimes they're bad and in between, but I think it really came to the surface in terms of my, my feelings about when you become a father, right. And you start to see, you know, you know, some of the things you live, some of the things you say, your example starts to show up right around the ages of probably six to nine, 10 years of age. Uh, uh, and now, you know, my youngest is 15, soon be 16, and my oldest is 25. Now they're out there doing real life, some of them anyway. So uh, I think you're talking about the post where I was actually in the car with my youngest. Uh, yes. Shortly, probably after our first podcast. My beard's thicker. You, know, yeah. you could probably live in it looking at that video. And I'll just, you know, it's just a disease. It's um, uh, it's it's like greed. I, I'll say this. It's it's like what Andy Stanley talks about, the enemy, the enemies of the heart, greed, lust, jealousy, mm -hmm. uh, guilt, these things you can't see unless you have help. Entitlement is it's a disease and it's tough to see from the from the inside out. Sometimes a lot of times you need help. Yeah. And I know I, like I did. It. So go ahead. No, I like I like what you said about look looking at yourself first as well, and I think it's definitely been a journey I've been on um, in the past few years. Because yeah. one, still on, if not a weekly basis, a daily basis, I'll have moments where I feel entitled and feel like the victim for whatever reason. And sometimes we are generally the victim, but I think most of the time when we're playing the victim, we're not. But I also look back and I think when I was younger, I was entitled all the time, and I was playing the victim all the time. And I also think. And I was trying to think, why does this happen? And I think often it's you're not admitting your own pain in a way. You you don't want to say, oh, I'm I'm hurting in this way, so I'm going to project my pain onto someone else and actually put it over there. So I was I was thinking about that myself, but it'd be interesting to hear like, you know, your own journey as well, because as you said, yeah. like sometimes you have to look in in the mirror yourself. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody has a pain free life, but that's all relative to someone else's pain, and you know. I, for me, you know, without rehashing my whole journey, you know, because some people watching this have heard it, but you know, I really come to grips with some roots of entitlement I had until really my 40s and going through a, a divorce. You know, when you're going through a big breakup or you're going through a job loss, you're going through, let's just say the death of a family member, right? A lot of people went yeah. through that. The first, You know, I don't know if people say this as much, but you think this shouldn't be happening to me. 
you know, I'm okay with it happening to you mm -hmm. and I'll be there and love you and hug you and console you, but it shouldn't happen to me. So entitlement's insidious because, uh, and I don't want to assume that anyone's lived a pain-free life, but if you haven't had a lot of uh, traumas and dramas and losses early in life, later in life, if you've lived maybe privilege, you've lived, I think we're all kind of privileged, right? But if yeah. you've lived that life for the first decade and a half, maybe three, without some big losses, it's really easy to think, hey, this shouldn't be happening. And so when you're going through that alone and you're trying to find resources, you know, a breakup, a, a loss, uh, it's easy to, to feel that. And then when you want to get kind of my point here is when you're trying to get healthy, when you're trying to live like a human on the heels of a loss of a child or of jobs or a marriage, and you're really going after, okay, this, this was done to me. What was my role in something? You know, uh, entitlement, you'll usually find it. On the pie chart of responsibility, I, I used to say pie chart of blame, but on the pie chart of responsibility, someone that loses, for example, a family member, and you know, they didn't spend time with them. Mm. They had all these opportunities. They didn't do it. And they're not responsible for the person passing, but they're trying to find re they're trying to find reason. They're trying to find meaning in that pursuit is you're going to see uh, potentially some entitlement that this shouldn't have happened. You know, yeah. I did a lot of the right things I did. Those are things that will come to the surface. And as you get healthy, you got to address it. You know, I know you I said, yeah. You said the question of what, what, you know, what was my role in that? Um, yeah. When you're self-reflecting on these things, do you think that's a, a key thing to ask yourself to stop entitlement? Or? Yeah, especially if you don't want to repeat it. Let's just use a, let's use a, let's use a boyfriend, girlfriend situation. Let's use a very less, maybe more benign example, less extreme example. If, you know, you have friends, I'm sure you, you know, I, I just keep, you know, I just keep meeting the wrong guy. You know, I just keep meeting the wrong girl. I mean, like you, you, at some point, you know, and this is, we've heard this, but you, you're the common denominator. And then there's a variety of reasons why you, you keep picking ones, picking the bad ones or yeah. picking ones that are not healthy. And there could be entitlement, right? I mean, have you seen this thing on Instagram? And I don't know if it's a it's legitimate or not, but some of these younger women that are, you know, the restaurants, the re this is in the U.S., the restaurants, like Cheesecake Factory or whatever, that they will not allow a man to take them on on a first, second, third day. It's like below their standard. I mean, this the epitome of entitlement. And I think it's a meme. I think some of it's real. Um, you know, those kind of things, mm -hmm. if you don't clean some of that up, you know, to more things like, hey, I'm entitled to be treated a certain way that I don't have to treat you. Kind of narcissistic mentality. Yeah. You know, you, you've got to go after some of that stuff. You got to fall on some of those swords and some of it's entitlement. Otherwise, guess what? You're going to attract the same thing, same people, same boss, same culture with a job, whatever it is, and probably have a repeat performance. I think the instance you're talking about, and I've, I'm in a happy relationship now, but before I was, I definitely think when I was having failed relationships in inverted commas, I definitely went on a journey where understanding was more on me. Uh, yep. But I do, I do know there's people that I know, friends of mine that probably listen to this that have in that situation currently so can you explain that more like how, how can you self-reflect and being like okay i've had these five yeah i picked five of the wrong people what am i doing wrong in this situation how can you go on that process of self-reflection i think number one is to dispel this myth and, and and identify what i think is a deception for all of us and that is because i have experience i'm wiser experience by itself doesn't make anybody smarter. It really doesn't. Uh, it's when you evaluate the experience that it has the potential of becoming I'm smarter or I'm, I'm wiser. Because therein lies the self-control to say, okay, um, I'm, I'm using this. I'm going through another breakup. I'm going through a divorce in my late 30s, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So you know what I'm going to do? Because I got married fast a second time, I'm going to go out to a calendar and, you know, I'm not dating anybody now, but I'm just going to go to my calendar and I'm going to put a little pin in it and say resume dating two years from now, one year from now. In other words, 
I'm making a personal commitment to obey myself when I say I shouldn't be dating. Why? Because I'm in a state of pain and I'm probably going to pick the wrong person to, you know, start over again. Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That's evaluating experience manifesting itself in tough and aggressive, no, aggressive, um, defined action to avoid, number one, repeat performance, but two, creating a, a not so pleasant dating experience for, for your next. So that's an example. And I could go on, you know, in, in professional life, you know, yeah. did you, Hey, I've got experience with toxic bosses. Okay, great. Cool, man. What have you done with that information to help build your expectations in a culture? So when you're in the interview process, you can intrinsically interview and snuff out toxicity before you take the job. There's ways to do that. That's evaluated experience. That's wisdom. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two is then it, I think it's all tactical and tangible. I think you got to have some accountability. You know, hey, Mike, it's a hypothetical. Michael, you're my one friend that isn't afraid to hurt my feelings, that loves and cares about me enough to say, okay, do you really want to do that? Because you, mm -hmm. this is looking like what you did the last time. So let's let's unpack that. So I could expound on that one person in your circle that's unbiased, yeah. not afraid to hurt you, but loves you and tell you the truth. And I think number three, I think writing is huge. For me, we talked about this on the first podcast, but, you know, left side, right side, pro, cons, whatever you want. You know, I teach people all the time that when you start to share your heart on a piece of paper and you're looking at it inductively and deductively, I mean, it doesn't take you long to really figure out what's garbage and what's truth you know what's hey you'll sell yourself you're the best salesman to yourself of the worst ideas no one has to convince you it's a good idea it's more like we got to convince you it's a bad idea michael right you really see that in writing so number one dispel the myth that what is wisdom versus experience number two accountability number three writing seeing your nonsense and truth the truth not your truth truth and nonsense on paper is huge yeah the bit about the accountability part like because also i think with this topic of entitlement actually if you if you're very entitled you could also relate that to like sensitivity right mm -hmm. and if you're the type of person that's very sensitive sometimes you don't want the friend that's actually going to give you very tough feedback that may hurt you in the short term but in the long term is in your mm -hmm. in your best interest so i think that's good advice actually have the friend who tells you how it is, right? And isn't a people pleaser and tells you direct, but makes you a better person for it. And I think it's the same in a in a partner in a relationship as well. You need someone that's actually going to say, "Hey, Michael, you're you're talking rubbish here," you know. So I think we're often not seeking those people, and those are the exact people we actually need in our lives. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I look back at you know the 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 fourth of the fourth move to New Hampshire, or the fourth move that moved us to New Hampshire, you know, decade ago. Had I been accountable and, 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 you know, we didn't need to move again. That marriage, I said this the first, it was in no condition to move a fourth time in under six years. It wasn't in, you know, so if I, you know, I had friends, but if I'd have really letting a guy in the door to, to what was going on between that 18 inch space of Michael and his fears and his trauma, you know, there's no way I, I would have still moved, but at least I would have moved knowing that I was like lying to myself. I was in this sense of deception that if I didn't have a, a, a great job, that was this because mm -hmm. it was the best of the six opportunities. That that I was less of a husband and less of a father. There was all this deception that really, I think, had I laid laid that bare before probably a man who's objective yeah. would have been able to snuff out the BS. I know before the podcast, we were talking about how you've um, you've got a team in Serbia, so you travel there a lot. And, you know, entitlement is something, well, at least I think the two of us agree is like a trend that's that's growing um, in the, you know, US, Canada, UK. Uh, do you think this is something that's like happening across the world at the moment? Or do you think it's something specific to our culture? Like when you go to Serbia, you're seeing the, the same types of things there as well? No, you don't. You don't. You see a lot more gratitude and hard work and, you know, it's a totally different culture. I'll just speak for the U.S. I mean, I just think we've, you know, when in history has, has, have we seen so much wealth and time 
And I'm guilty too. I mean, I, I spend too much time on social media. I'll, I'll fall on the yes. first. I mean, you know, it was, it was, this is, this is edgy, but I mean, I saw a guy talk about, you know, something about pronouns and he said, you know, man, I mean, when you're living in a culture where, you know, bombs are dropping on your city and you don't know how you're going to get running water and this and that you don't, you don't spend time worrying about offending somebody. In pro I'm not saying that the way someone wants to be called isn't important. I'm just saying that's a sense of entitlement when that's the priority over other things. And so it, you see a lot of in the U.S. I mean, we're, we're really blessed. It's a blessed country for sure. Uh, it's also got a lot of entitlement because we've got so much time. We have so much wealth, we have so much uh, bounty. That's why so many want, you know, are trying to get in here. I might go on and on, but yeah, I didn't see a lot in Serbia, you know? Yeah. So, um, had another guy on the show, he made a guy called Miles Beth, who's um who's a believer as well. And one of the things I talked about with him is how do you manage being an entrepreneur like you, who's also a believer? How do you manage that quote in the Bible that it's, you know, it's it's harder for a rich man. Um, so it's harder for the camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven, right? And um, he was talking, it's more around what you do with your wealth, right? But anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up because related to what you're you're saying. I totally agree. And I think we've almost got so much and so much wealth that sometimes um, we, people that don't have that, they're more like in the real 1%. And often I've seen this, I've gone to some of the poorest areas in the world, but people have like unbelievable faith and happiness and, and spirituality. So That's I think right. sometimes it's almost, we have so much material wealth that the spiritual is, is lacking. But yeah, I mean, with that Bible quote, I know that's something you've ever thought about as well. Well, because I mean, I, I'll, I know what it, I know the context of why he said that, you know, the, the, as I re remember the rich ruler comes say, Hey, I've done everything. What else do I need to inherit, you know, to, to make, to get through the, to get, to get through the gates. I've done everything. I respect my dad. I do this. I get, but, mm. um, and it was the one thing. What I re remember from that story is, the, you know, Jesus was really saying after the fact, here's sell all you have and follow me. And then, you know, depending on the, the the translation, which one of the four gospels you, mm. you read it from, and especially in the message version, it's like, you know, this this thing came over this, I'll call it kid, this young man's face. Like, I didn't expect you to say that. I mean, this is my security. This is my, this is my foundation, my money. And we, you know, we've all been there. You know what it means to get a raise or to get a something or a new client, whatever you do. And and feel like you're, you know, you're a little bit further away from, or you're a little bit more bulletproof. And I think there's a lot of things to take about what Jesus was saying, but, but, you know, one of the things that I don't think it's talked about a lot, at least in the pulpit, is the freedom that comes with saying, it's all yours. There's nothing, it, you know, I'm a steward. You can take it all, all these talents, my ability to reason, my ability to speak clearly, my ability to write, take everything you have from your talents and your talents that allow you to earn that money. Wait, you own it all. So I'm not clinching anything. Thank you. But this fit, this hand is not clinched. And I think that ruler, I don't know if it was a ruler, it was a young leader, rich guy. He was holding on so tight. Hmm. That it just broke his heart. He's like, "What? You want me to do that? Yeah, I want you to do that because look at what I'm. You don't see what's coming. If you'll give me that, if you'll trust me with that, you don't see what I'm getting ready to put in there. I mean, there's so many lessons from it, but that's that's one that sticks out. You can't put anything in a clenched fist, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah. is your is one of your um, learnings from that and about letting go as well? Like even if you had all, have all of this stuff, it's about being able to let go of it at any moment. Yeah, I mean the other stuff. Forget about the tangible. The in, for me, you know, I mean I hoarded stuff and I was greedy with stuff and greedy with money. I've been down that path and I could probably be that guy again. But really, for me, it was like the same thing on the inside, mm. the inside of Michael of past disappointments and betrayals and stuff. And it's like you know, if that's your heart, I mean, look at that thing. It's just so tight. You know, learning to open up and you know. 
it's tougher to be happy when you're like this on the inside. So yeah, I mean, hey, just let go and let God. I really don't like that. I understand it. First off, hmm. I don't even think that's in the Bible. That in that sequence, much like follow your heart's not in the Bible. See that all over uh, social media now. The five things Jesus never said. Show me where let go, let God is. I, that's kind of like an evangelical thing. I, you know, to I get it, but to add some context and meaning to that, you know, it's how do you want to do life? What story do you want to tell? I mean, when you look at my kids and how they saw me sort of manage a lot of the things in that divorce, I didn't handle a lot of it. Well, they saw a lot of that. Hmm. And they were younger. And so the, I can see some of this in their life versus like, and I don't live in regret, but what I'm just trying to acknowledge what you said, like, if I could have lived a little bit more like that on some things, I probably would have had more peace. And that's what he's yeah. saying. Yeah, that's what he's saying. It's like, hey, you know, what life do you want to live? Yeah, you said earlier around how, you know, just having children, seeing them grow up, seeing yourself and your children mm -hmm. helps you be less entitled. Can you, can you explain a bit more about that? Mm, well, no, it could be the opposite. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, especially when it, when you have children. I mean, like if you if you've ever been a um, I can't remember. You have kids? No, no, I don't. Have okay, kids okay. Yeah. And when you're first becoming a parent, you're like, this is my. You know, for me, it was like this is my kid. It was not. Depending on what your beliefs, I mean, you're a steward. Yeah. That that child is on loan. It's a <laughs> totally different way of looking at it. Not like they're a rental car, but I'm saying like they're not going to be there. You know, my oldest is 25. They're not going to be there forever. So this entitled attitude, I mean, yeah, you're, it's your job to, to, to protect them and care for them and provide and teach them and as your child. That, I get that. But, but a deeper thing is that they really belong to who created them, you know? And so that's number one uh, to battle that because a lot of times when, when a parent is like that, like my, that's where the helicopter parent comes from. That's where um, at times this, inability to let a child make a mistake you know my child my thing mine you know when it's mine i'm gonna do what i need to do to protect it and cultivate it and you know and i get that but you know parents need and I, this took me a while parents need to remember they're not raising they're raising an adult one day they need to be able to think for themselves and so uh, that's one thing i think uh just entitlement in like how you handle disappointments, they're watching. And really on the nonverbal, I mean, what I struggled with early and and not early, but sometimes still, like, it's just my face, man. Fix your face. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when something goes wrong in a drive through at a restaurant, like, what's your face say? You know, at a restaurant, I mean, it's little things, like trying to find the joy and disappointment versus like, this shouldn't have happened, even when it shouldn't have happened, will have a huge impact on entitlement quotients for your children. And I didn't always win that battle now now more so you give me five opportunities to be entitled on silly stuff or seven I, I'm, I'm winning the battle five and point three out of seven in terms of just my face but sometimes i don't handle it right yeah i remember one of the things you said on fatherhood in the last program i really liked i think i did a post on this after we spoke was um yeah. you can tell like how well you've done as a parent by like when your kids are adults how much time they want to spend with you and yeah. i think going into what you said is it's not just the love but often it's like real unconditional love not just oh you're my kid and you're mine and but it's actually giving having love to give them freedom and make their own mistakes as you yeah. said as well i think that's really wise yeah i don't know if i always communicated it the right way i mean mine mine especially on once the breakup i mean when it was just me and them i got better at well, I got more objective on how I parented in terms of uh, how I was going to influence or really pull away from controlling decisions, trying to control a decision or an outcome versus influence. Yeah. Because when you become a single parent, you don't, you don't, it's not that we were doing it wrong so much as we just, we both had to, two parents had to become better because we weren't together. So, um, you know, I started to change that a little bit. Now, like with my youngest, like if I don't hear him thinking in his question, I just get, I try to get quiet and he doesn't like that because I want him to think through the answer. What, what generated that question? Because the answer's in front of him, you know, and sometimes that can come mm. off a little, 
a little bumpy, but uh, he gets smarter and he gets better. I mean, here's a kid that, you know, he's got two businesses. He's 15, two businesses. And, you know, a year ago, he was 30 pounds out of whack. He really went after his health. He went after, you know, this idea of usefulness at a young age. You know, just how, how can I be useful to people to earn income? And he's got two things he's doing. In fact, we're about to get hit with a snowstorm. He's going to be out plowing snow for money. Nice. Uh, what's unique about that is the approach I took and said, this is what you need to be doing. Like, this is... You know, this is trying to model it as a business owner and as someone who who stays fit uh, and then helping him grab it. You know, that's a totally different approach. Yeah. Kind of like off topic, said, but that's how it manifests itself. Go ahead. No, no, I like it. I like what you said about like sil the use of silence as a father yeah. as well, because I I thought some a lot of sales is communication, right? So a lot of the things that I teach in sales training, you can apply in your personal life, but sometimes I'm better at doing it in my business than like yeah. with my partner Anna or like my parents or my brother or whoever it is or my friends and sometimes it's like why is that you know you should be there's got to be that consistency you know yeah um i one of the topics we talked about on the last show as well was workaholism uh and i think it, i i thought about i was i was thinking about the topics we discussed before and that one stood out to me because I was having this thing over Christmas of not guilty, sorry, not working, but feeling guilty about it, which I think is stupid, right? You will, everyone needs to give themselves a break. Um, but yeah, what, have, have your thoughts changed at all around around workalism and you know your relationship with it as well as an entrepreneur? Not so much. I mean, especially man, I'm, I'm, I'm a year, I'm a year, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a year more seasoned instead of saying yeah. it, I'm older, uh, more seasoned by a year, probably a year and a half since we spoke. I think it was September. I was in Serbia, September, 2022. I think it was right. Um, no, even more, just double and triple down on those thoughts, which is um, live your best life now, best you can uh, do, do great work, but you know, knowing how to cut that off and realizing that someone's waiting on you, hopefully kids or significant other wife, spouse, whatever that you know, husband, whatever that is. And, you know, realizing that, you know, falling in love with work for the joy of work, Hmm. is a whole lot different than workaholism and because it, you, you you realize with the joy of work you should treat it as, as it's more maybe finite you treat work and the joy of work as more finite like it has a beginning and an end because at four o'clock your brain checks out you, you can only take in so much information before x i mean more of these things that are true about all of us or not all of us but a lot of us I think you you can hedge against workaholism, and then there's relationships. You know, nobody so, wants to sit there and watch their dad texting when they're out. You know, at a birthday party. Yes, nobody wants oh, to yeah, watch that. that. But that's, uh, that's I a think, topic that's come up a lot. Yeah, parent parents go through that. I think all parents have to go through that. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's kind of uh, we've actually had a, a couple of um, people come on some entrepreneurs. So I'm not yeah. talking about that presence with your with your family, children. It doesn't have to be children; can be with whoever, right? And you mentioned that uh, you know social media. You spend too much time on social media. I I spend too much time on social media as well. We had a social media addiction expert come on as well, but like. Wow. How, how are you managing that relationship as well? Especially, and even, I guess, an interesting topic that I've thought about as well. And in the UK, we've got, which I don't agree with, the Prime Minister saying wants to ban social media for people under 16, which has never <laughs> worked. Uh, but, um, but yeah, how do you manage your own relationship with social media? And then how are you teaching your, your kids to manage their relationship with social media? Well, I, I, I the Prime Minister, what is his name? Rishi Sunak. Yeah. You know, I could see, I could see under the, you know, well, let me say this. When you start to get to 10 to 16, which is a huge range. I mean, I, I, especially with the two youngest, I embraced when they were getting 10, 11, 12, I tried to embrace more of an attitude of, Hey, listen, tomorrow they're going to vote tomorrow. They're going to be 30. So I could see what he's talking about, you know, under six, eight years of age, maybe. Um, but banning, I don't really like the idea of, of it's, it's kind of like what Bloomberg did in New York. He couldn't get the snow off the streets, but he was talking to people about 20 versus 24 ounce, you know, sodas, going to ban 24 ounce sodas, but he can't get the snow off. So it's like these, these, <laughs> these, 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 right. These, these, that's what we're looking for. 
politicians oftentimes well intended you know they can't solve the felony so they yeah. you know, they go after the misdemeanor silly i mean i'm not saying you know I, i've seen the social dilemma i've seen you know in, in my own journey with mental health and my own kids with social media i'm just saying like it's more around empowerment education you know when i'm empowered and i'm educated i'm educated and I'm empowered versus controlled I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about what his stance is, but you know, under the age of sixteen, I mean, sixteen, they can be driving a car in in a week yeah. you know, and be voting. You know, it's like I don't. I don't. That age doesn't make sense. So for me, it's been trying to model it. Yeah, I also think prohibition. Obviously, it didn't work with alcohol, right? And Al Capone and all that stuff. It's not. It's not working mm -hmm. with drugs. So what? Why is it going to work with social media? You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it should be regulated, maybe. That's my view. I think it needs to be regulated more, but I don't think it needs to be, I mean, just banning it, I think it's ridiculous. So. I like the idea of the lawsuit, I think, just came out uh, against Meta with, I mean, there's now data, documented evidence that they built those platforms, specifically Instagram, to addict kids. Yeah, that's, like, we know we're doing it. No. Kind of like, you know, the cigarette company, we know we're doing it. Yeah. I, li I like, I like, uh, letting have you know having a punitive response to that but telling parents that you know we're gonna come into your home and take the phone out of your kid's hand that's not the right approach i'm no. never a fan of that 100 percent um as in your own words you said you're a year more seasoned uh which is you know year, year or year and a half uh have, have there been any big learnings in your in the last year i think you're the first person we've actually had that's come on twice by the way yeah. so i thought it would be a good question to ask you know, be, be, be prepared for down. You know, we just, we've all seen a, uh, some downturn and, yeah. you know, it's not a learning, but a reinforcement of what I already saw in 2008. I mean, 2008, when, the, when everything was going sideways in the world with the economy and jobs and housing and everything, you know, I was getting, I was going through blessing and promotion and favor this time around you know i didn't prepare as well for it but uh i accepted you know that this is just what it is and it brought to the surface that hey you don't have to keep doing the same things and it really brought to the surface that i wanted to go do some other things so i've opened myself up to some some other uh, opportunities to express what I'm, what I really enjoy, which is people development. In other words, when things go down, look mm -hmm. at it as an opportunity, you know, Hey, your, your business is down 50%. You're, you know, you get let go, you know, just, just reinforcing that learning that that's, you know, not that I don't want to be when the one door closes one, you know, okay. But really, you know, what brings you joy, and especially for me, you know, I got one more to get through high school and he's right there. So, you know, your life has different dimensions and the possibility has different dimensions. Don't, don't feel, don't give into those feelings of failure. If, if you had setbacks in the last 18 months, yeah. um, those are opportunities, you know, and that's for someone like me that didn't always believe that, that, you know, everything was sort of do or die in the first 30 years of life. That's a big deal. What are some of the new things you're working on? Are they, are they secrets? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But, but they are, but they're opening myself up to working with people and uh, developing people. Um, I'll just say uh, in, in the sales arena, you know, I grew up in, I grew up in operations and then I was in B2B sales and I, you never see me come out and give, I think on your stuff, I'll jump in and, and drop a little thing here and I have a sales yeah. course with Ron and stuff like that. But you know, it's such a saturated space, but I've, I don't really talk much about it publicly. I just enjoy doing it offline uh so i've got a, a, a team of people outside of lead and media i'm working with like in the field uh traditional b2b teleprospecting on monday in the field monday through friday uh thursday tuesday through friday i mean i'm enjoying it and i'm traveling so it's fun nice very cool but it is, but it is a secret yeah, yeah. For now. yeah another another i guess <clears throat> shouldn't be controversial topic but but is nowadays and you know obviously you mentioned the thing about the, the pronouns earlier it's already got a bit controversial is um around uh i think i think it was a post you had around like 
male suicide um and me- uh, women you know actually craving more masculinity um in our society and we had a a guy on uh will castle whose dad sadly c- committed suicide he was a guy i went to university with and for years he didn't talk about it but eventually started talking about it now he, he campaigns um you know men's mental health but yeah i guess why why do you think women or a lot of women are craving like more masculinity uh in our society and i guess what is positive masculinity as well yeah that's a lot so <laughs> i think the craving is is i mean what i saw you know is that the the assault on it you know did men did men start it with being bad boys maybe but um the toxic side of the feminist movement because i think some of the feminist movement we've needed uh but the toxic side that's all about power and is not symmetric and not consistent yes the extreme side of me too that people used that it wasn't about harvey weinstein anymore it was about dominating and and wielding power you know those energies have have you know, continue to want to strip uh, masculinity away from men. And so what happens is you have a generation of men on the, on the couch. They're not, they're not leaving home. They're not in their twenties. They're not looking for a spouse. They're not, uh, they're, they're playing video games. They're addicted to porn. They're, um, they're victims. They've grown up in a university system that's taught them how to be a victim, yeah. or that they're or they're or that they're, they're if they're white, if they're a white male, they're an oppressor because of what happened X years ago. And I'm not saying we don't have racism, we do, but it's they don't know how to leave and assimilate, uh, pursue a um, I'm using men now, right? Pursue a a mate, a wife, yeah. you know. Uh, you see, I'm in a space where, you know, I'm in, I'm in, I've been doing this for years, but I'm in some Facebook groups where it's just like, women are just complaining about there's no more good men and this and that and the rest. And sometimes I'm a little satirical in my natural, but a lot of times I, I engage it and, um, you know, they talk beyond the noise. They talk about some real stuff that just, there's a whole group of men that don't know how to say you know, they won't pay on the first date. And if they do, they've paid on the first date, they offend a woman because they're dealing with that. It's just on and on and on. And at the root of it, if you go dig, dig, dig deep, it's a moral bankruptcy starting at home, the breakdown of the family. And that's coming from a guy who's divorced. I didn't want a divorce, right? Um, so I have to be careful how I tread, like, because I'm I'm part of it. And I grew up in a broken family, but I still believe in the, I still believe in covenant marriage. I still believe in... Yeah the nuclear family and that you need men and women to shepherd children in the context of a, of a, of a healthy family. We don't, we, there's an assault on that. Yeah. And so toxic masculinity is a myth. (laughs) It's a myth. It's toxic people that are men and toxic people that are women. Yeah. hundred percent. And and for me, I think one of the problems is, and I remember actually, I was at an event once, I think it was in uh, Chicago. This was a while about four or five years ago. And then a woman who was very kind of dressed, very masculine style, like in a suit, she was complaining because another woman was wearing a short dress and she was like, oh, how can a woman dress like that? And, yeah. you know, 2020 or 2019, whenever it was. And I thought, isn't, I, I agree with you that there's, you know when feminism started it was a good thing but it's all being twisted but it's like isn't that the whole point women should be allowed to dress how they like and then that you shouldn't be telling another woman like how she should act and i think that's the problem is we've almost taught and i think this is a big problem in the west specifically we've taught women to act more like men versus embracing their own femininity you know so for me i think that that's a big issue yeah i mean i i'll, I'll just pull it up I, I i had a meme on um on Facebook that, you know, I, I, I've responded to, uh, I'll just read it to you. It's, I was being satirical, but it says basically, you know, um, that a, a, a woman, you know, a single woman with her own life, her own money and who knows her own worth is the hardest person in the world to impress. And I said, and single woman, I just don't know why I can't find a good guy. And, you know, most people, 
some people, some women took to that to mean like, oh, you're afraid of an independent woman. It wasn't. It was satirically saying we all have seen the avatar, the female caricature and avatar and real person who's like, I don't need a man. And I get mm -hmm. that. I get I get that. I'm OK with that. But then don't be surprised when you, you don't have one. Uh, and what I'm really trying to say is, hey, we all we, we were built for a relationship. Yeah. We we need intimacy. We need connectivity. Yeah. And now I'm talking about in traditional the side of things that I don't even touch on, like how you choose to find that. I, I'm not here to adjudicate that. I'm saying yeah. for me, uh, and how I've tried to teach my children is we need we need a relationship. And a woman, it's okay to say you want and need a man. You know, it's okay to say that in healthy ways. And and so, most of the women got it. You know, yeah. and some got offended because it was they they missed the satire of it. Yeah. You know? I mean, I've been thinking. And as you know, I'm sure, like you were saying recently, you've been on this journey of your your business is evolving and the things you're doing are evolving. And I've also been on a journey with this podcast because when I started, the cosmic bridge was around the bridge between the material and the spiritual and that balance. And actually, for me now, it's more like, how can we just have more balance in general? And if I can get one, say, with Israel, Palestine, if I can get one Jewish person to speak to one Muslim and have a conversation and a debate like we used to have, right, or one Ukrainian, one Russian... And even now it's like men and women, right? Because I think, as you said, there's loads of women out there who are like, oh, I hate men. I don't want to be in a relationship. But even if one woman can just have a conversation with a man and realize yeah. we're not all bad or like vice versa, right? Because then you've got the whole, you know, Andrew Tate culture, which sometimes is saying, well, women are bad, right? So it's like, yeah. there's that there's that balance. And for me, that's that's really what I'm trying to trying to do with this, uh, this podcast. So Yeah, I mean, someone's going to, I hope one person will be like, you know, watch this and realize that some of the stuff that I talk about, you know, there's a, there's a human behind that keyboard. Yes. And there's, you know, I'm, I'm influenced. I'm, I'm coachable. I'm influenceable. If that's a word. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I'm my, my sole number one job was been to raise adults as a single father. And that, that comes with a responsibility and I've gotten it wrong and I've tried to get it right too. So with that comes, more more good than bad for sure but needing to stand for things yeah yeah the thing is right obviously because you've been talking about your, your kids a lot today which is great i think one of the things i see in my company but i think in general speaking to a lot of people and i'm not even old i'm 34 right so i would say i'm you know middle middle of my life maybe a bit before that but i see a lot of even people my age saying oh you know 21 year olds they're like the snowflake generation and they're sensitive yeah. etc some people are like that but often like my nephew for example he's 17 he sounds more like like your kids um so what do you think do you think in general the stereotype's true that like younger generations are we're living in the snowflake or, or what do you think when people say that i mean i've never wanted to say that you know because you you know when you start using color and referrals to color it's such a slippery slope and other offensive things and that you know just snowflakes mean they're fragile yeah there's uh, there's some fragility out there, you know, but I always say like, you know, in my humanity, I've been fragile Yes. You know, in, in my, with some things. And so I try to look at it. Um, I'm going to answer your question. I try to look at it with a little bit more grace. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the proliferation of um, wealth and, um, time and how technology and just and i'm just talking about people who live in the west how things are done faster and we get information faster we get products goods and services fast everything's faster uh so we have more time um and then you have again i you have a system of of, of educating uh, that uh, has needed to create uh, beyond what we have, a, a, an oppressor and oppressed class. You know, we have a bigger demand for racism than we have supply. That's just a fact. By any empirical viewpoint, uh, it's created that. And so these younger people have this dilemma, like what side am I going to be on? You know, am I going to buy into that, that ecosystem? The ethos that says, hey, I am... Um, a bad person because of how I was born 
I am an oppressed person because how I was born, or am I going to screw all that, screw the noise, pull my, pull my, my boots up by the straps. I need some help, but for the most part, I'm going to help myself. That's, that's hard to find. The latter is hard to find. And you see that, you see that in the, in the, mm. in the way this, you brought up Israel, Palestine, you know, without touching much, you see a lot of that on our campuses. It's like, how do you come to this country? How do you come to this country and flee a country that you could never, never do and say what you're doing on these campuses and then attack the host like you do? How do you do that? Well, you do that because that's what's been modeled and that's what's been taught. You know, that's exactly how it's been taught. And I, you know, it's difficult, I think, for some parents that are sitting there saying, hey, am I going to go drop 75 grand a year or 30 grand a year to mm. send my kids to get that? Yeah. They're teaching that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say one thing. I mean, I, I was in college in the early, uh, early nineties and I, I heard it. This isn't like a new phenomenon. We're just seeing, mm. we're seeing, when you talk about the snowflake generation, we're seeing the manifestation and the outcome of that ideology that's been going on for 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. Do, um, do you think there's hope for the, for the education system and like, you know, the West, or do you think it's like completely got to change if there's any hope? No, I think we're going to need more scandals like we have right now at Harvard. I think we're going to need, we're going to need, um, I'm trying to think of a figure in history. We're going to need a Martin Luther moment where it's like on the door. We're going to need more people to stand up and say, you know, no more. No. I don't care what you call me. Call me a racist. Call me a, call me an every ist and ick. Is it phobic ist, ism, ism, ist, and ix? I don't care what you call me. I don't care what you say about me on Twitter. I don't care how you deplatform me. We're going to need more people like that. And you know where it's going to happen? It's going to happen. Um, it's going to need to happen on in the, the same places and cultures that started, which was, you know, the bi, at least in the U.S., the bi-postal white progressive elites who because of their wealth and mm. their privilege said to, 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 because we're so rich, yeah, we feel like we're guilty and we need to do something. And they've created this, this Frankensteinian approach to education has trickled down. Yeah. It'll happen. It'll happen in that group because when systems start to break down, when the consequences mm. of those bad ideas start to show up in Menlo park, and Boston, yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah. Uh, we, we just haven't had that yet. I don't know. You know, here, just one, I mean, we've got a, we've got a elite, the, the most prestigious unit, one of them in the, in the, in the world president who's just been resigned, fired. And we're, we're sitting here as a culture trying to redefine and define what plagiarism is. It's fascinating so yeah we're gonna need more of that and then courageous people that stand up and say no more no not sending my kids there we're, we're, no. we we want you to tax endowments i mean you're gonna to have to have some aggressive and you just can't find that in politics i mean they're most of them are bought no. i don't know yeah i'm kind of it's kind of like an e eeyore response so. well that that redefining is obviously something happened with genders but we won't go we won't go down that rabbit hole because uh yeah. we, we yeah. could do another podcast on that and people have already said enough about that um <laughs> So I wanted to ask you a lot of last questions. So um, imagine you're in a room, let's say you, you get 30 minutes. I'm not going to ask you to give a 30 minute answer, but kind of yeah. summarize it with someone who's at one of these universities who I don't like this um, phrase, but you know, it is woke in inverted commas and, you know, plays more of the victim and, and being oppressed, even though they're from like a, you know, middle-class background or whatever. Cause I, I don't think the solution obviously is saying, you know, hey, you're a victim, you're, you're doing this. And as I think we both said, we see ourselves sometimes in these younger people when, when we were that age as well. But how do you think like older people can communicate in a certain way with uh, with some some of these people that are at universities like this? Well, the first question I have is, am I going to have a like an escort? <laughs> am I going <laughs> to, you know, am I going to have like, you know, am I going to be behind a, a, a glass, you know, protected glass uh, but seriously I, I i'd have to give that a lot of thought at, at a at a quick pass 
it's trying to paint a picture that the way you think the world is now, and I did too, it's just not the way it works. Again, whether you're going to be an employee, an executive, a business owner, or an educator, you want to be just like, you know, at some point in that journey, you're accountable. You'll be responsible for what you do or don't do, what you create or don't create. And try to give, you know, tangible examples that they can relate to. Because what they see is, mm -hmm. you know, educators and academics that that are, I don't think they're bad people. I think there's a lot of evil in academia, but I think it's it's more of a system of, uh, it's more of a bureaucracy of, of how they operate and how they, you know, engage in careerism and a lot of that. And those kids think that's real, you know? Mm -hmm. Let me, you know, let me go in and tell a story about when when we first built this business and how it was on the razor's edge and we said we were going to do it debt free. How crazy that was. That was insane. You know, and try to give them something they can and just just say and then I think have real estate. If I had 50 of them in there, you said one person or if I had 50, if I reached two or three of them. And then try to transition that into mm -hmm. relation like with relationships. Personal accountability and your professional life and personal accountability and relationships. And, you know, I think that's where I'd have a lot more impact because, you know, take 50 kids. They, they, there's some broken families in that group, you know, and trying to help them understand that, hey, I wasn't oppressed because my dad was an alcoholic. I wasn't oppressed because I watched him do things. Um, it was oppressive at that moment, but at some point, you know, maybe north of the age of 16, I was making decisions. That's going to be you, Mr. College and Mrs. College Kid. So don't yeah. think what you're hearing after I'm out of here is the way the world works, because it's not. And I just want you to be happy. Uh, yeah. I want you to be, and there's, I think one of the final point is, the most happiest people that you'll meet there's a lot, what's happiness, but one of them along this topic is people, someone that just can look in the mirror and take personal accountability, can admit when they're wrong. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of power in that. And back to the the Harvard situation, just, just imagine where that situation would be if the, if the person in question in the board just apologized. Yeah. We didn't say the right things when you asked us about anti-Semitic behavior. We did, we failed, we this. Instead, it's cover, 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 hide, hide, hide. And, you know, I don't think people come back from that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's politicians as well. They never admit their mistakes. I think if they did, yeah. they'd, they'd be more successful. They'd be more human. Uh, but yeah, I like, I like that as a final takeaway. More personal accountability equals uh, more happiness. Because it's uh, so empowering. It's like, there's so much, there's very little you can control in this life, but I can control that. And, and, Oh, you know, if some if some guy looking like me would have stood up at Georgia State, I'd been like, this guy's a nut. <laughs> Look at what I'm facing, man. I got traffic. I got, you know, I'm. But you're just trying to impact one or two or yeah, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That goes in the subconscious as well. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, finally, we'll put, a, we'll put a link to your LinkedIn, the two posts yeah. you sent. Any other resources, any other things you've got going on at the moment you want us to put in the show notes? No, if, just if you want to get reach out, you know, work with with people and help them get specific breakthroughs with specific issues on my coaching business. And then, yeah, the, the LinkedIn lead generation, we're still working that with LinkedIn media. So if you need help with okay. that, reach out. Awesome. Yeah. Well, like it was last year, it's been uh, epic to, to chat to you, Michael. Likewise, Michael, thanks for having me on. This is awesome. So second episode with Michael Chapman, we discussed some different content today. I think Michael's evolved. I've evolved myself as an interview in the last year. So obviously it was a different type of show today, but that last takeaway more personal accountability equals more happiness. I absolutely love, it's very simple, but obviously the opposite of that, if you see yourself as a victim of your circumstances, of your situation, thinking you can do nothing about it, obviously that's gonna to lead to more sadness, more depression. And we all do that sometimes. We all sometimes don't take up accountability and play the victim. I can still look at times in the last week I've done that, but the important thing is to not beat yourself up and generally, 
try and take more accountability because that's going to lead to more happiness and think okay how can i improve myself in this situation how can i be a better person what can i do going forward to make this situation better that is that personal accountability and that is what's going to lead to more happiness if you think there's a friend of yours that needs to listen to this episode please send it to them please give us a review on spotify apple wherever you listen to it really helps us grow the show and we'll see you next week cheers